Welcome to this week's episode of Baseball Family. This week we have Otani officially on the trading block. The Yankees are in the cellar in an interview with author Tim Brown. Nine Plus Us presents the Baseball Together podcast with your hosts, Blackjack Brad and Kansas City Little Big Briggy Blue Eyes. And now, Baseball Together. Welcome, baseball family, to this week's episode of the Baseball Together podcast. My name is Brad, and I am flying solo this week because Brig is not flying. Uh, by that, I mean he was flying to see family, and he, at least the last 24 hours, has had uh, flights delayed, was not able to reach his destination. I don't know if he has yet. Um, I won't say who the airline is, but I will say they may or may not share the name of, uh, share a name with a letter in the Greek alphabet. So there you go. I'm here flying solo because Brig is not. Now, let's get right into it because there's not a lot, but I think we have quality over quantity this week. So first things first, the Angels have announced that Mr. Shohei Otani is on the trade block. And by that, I mean they've said they're going to start listening to offers. Before, I think it was like, Otani, click. No, we don't want to trade him. But now they're willing to deal. I think they figured, figured out that the writing is on the wall that he's not going to come back uh, as a free agent. And they can't let him walk because a compensatory draft pick is not enough, not nearly enough for what you could get for Shohei Otani. So that being said, I think we need to keep in mind that this doesn't necessarily guarantee that he will be dealt. It, Like I said, they're going to be listening. They're open to it. But the asking price is going to be really, really high. And for a guy who hits free agency uh, after this season, I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to see if somebody ponies up and gives the angels exactly what they're looking for or close to what they're looking for, because they are going to want a King's ransom and then some for Shohei Otani. So that being said, where do we think we'll go today? Monday, the angels already said they're not going to trade him to the Dodgers. They don't want to deal him to the Dodgers because they certainly do not want to help the crosstown rival, the team that they are battling for TV ratings for. Um, They're just, they've been a rival with for, several decades what five decades now at this point something like that Uh, they don't want to help out the Dodgers at all so they're not going to send Otani to the Dodgers so they're off the list Buster only of ESPN I thought this was really interesting over the weekend he said that the Yankees are the most motivated to make a deal for Shohei Otani I'm curious what it is that makes them the most motivated besides the fact that Buster only works for ESPN and pretty much the only thing they ever want to talk about is the Yankees and then if they're talking about an individual player it's Shohei Otani Right. So maybe ESPN is the most motivated to pull some strings if they can to get Otani to the Yankees. But on the other hand, like ESPN doesn't super care about baseball. So I don't know if they're going to, if they even could get involved. So no, I, I thought that was really funny that, yeah, maybe they are the most motivated, but I don't know what makes them more motivated than any other team in the league that maybe they'll overpay to get Otani. They'll send way too many guys over there, way too many big league ready players, and then they won't have anything left. I mean, I don't know. That seems like a George Steinbrenner move, not a Hal Steinbrenner move, but maybe it is. Maybe it's just maybe it is a Cashman move. Maybe that's what Cashman does. And Otani does finish the season in pinstripes, and it is only for the two months, and he doesn't go back because I don't see him as a Yankee. He's not an East Coast guy. We've seen several people say that over the last week or so. And I, I said it to Brig before that I felt like if he wanted to go to the Yankees, he'd be there already, right? I don't think anything has changed his mind in the time that he's been in the big leagues to make him want to go or want to stay a Yankee if he is a rental. But we thought that with Anthony Rizzo, and look, he's still there too. But, um, but anyway, uh, like I said, we know he's not going to go to the Dodgers. Um. As a Mariners fan, I know I've talked a lot about this on the show here, on the big show, and also on the Seattle podcast about Otani being a Mariner. But the thing is, is I don't see the Mariners selling the farm to get Otani now because I think that if they are going to go after him, I think they feel like they have a real shot at getting him in free agency for a lot of reasons, which I don't think I'm going to go into those today. But I think that it makes a lot of sense. We talked about some of them before. Anyway, um, I don't think that the Mariners would be going after him in a trade for the, that's one reason. Like I said, they think that he's their viable landing spot in the offseason. But also because Shohei Otani, as much of a talent as he is, as much as he does for a team, he's not going to fill in the, 
the blanks and be and fill and make up the deficit the Mariners have right now for for being a World Series team. Because if if he could, the Angels would be in contention right now. Yes, they're two games under 500 going into Monday, and they're not. The wild card is not out of reach, where it's possible but not probable, right? Where it's like, yeah, they could make a run, but it, it just doesn't look like with that team. The Mariners aren't that way with the World Series. Like they could go on a run and make the playoffs as a wild card team, but the definite, but there'd have to be a lot that went right for them to be a, a World Series team. And I don't think that between where they are now or where they would even be to be a playoff team. I don't feel like Otani makes up enough of a difference for them to be a World Series team this year. So I don't think the Mariners go after him. That was a really long-winded explanation. I apologize for that. Maybe I'll cut some of that out. But anyway, uh, some teams that I think could maybe scare up something in their system somewhere uh, to make a trade. I think that we could see um, Texas making a deal. Uh, Cincinnati has a really deep, a really good farm system. They have a lot of really young talent that they could deal for Otani. Miami has a lot of really young guys. I don't know that it's necessarily talent, but like, I don't know, maybe it's like collectively they could send guys to, to Anaheim, but that's, I mean, what you're looking for anyway. Houston, Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay seems to always pull somebody out and, and make a deal. I don't know that Otani's the deal because I don't think they want to pay for him this year, and they're certainly just going to let him walk, but he could be the piece that puts them over the top for and wins a World Series, and they're like, thanks, here's your ring, catch you next year somewhere else, right? I think I said Cincinnati, yeah, and uh, in Arizona. Sneaky. Very Arizona could be really sneaky in this. Um, I think that the Angels would be really motivated to stick it to the Dodgers in one way or another, and that is one way they re they really could do that, is if the D-backs came with a pretty decent package and uh, and the Angels are just like, you know what? You're in the same division as the Dodgers. You're competing with them this year. Um, we'll send them your way, and good luck to you. Hopefully uh, things work out for you and you end up beating the Dodgers because the D-backs are on a bit of a, are, I don't even, I wouldn't even say a bit of a slide right now. They've had a tough stretch the last couple of weeks, but uh, bringing Otani in, they need some pitching. Uh, another bat never hurts, right? So I don't know. That'd be really interesting. My two, my, that's one of my sneaky guesses. Honestly, I would say the two places he most likely ends up. One is Houston. Houston has always has a deep farm system. They can make deals for, for guys. And then the other one is Houston. I asked Brig. I texted him. I said, do you have a, a guess? And he actually said Arizona as well because he, he I, I brought it up to me. And he initially said the Dodgers. I told him, well, let me get you caught up on the news today. I know you've been out of it. So, so I told him not the Dodgers. And so then his other one was Texas. He thinks Texas because he's Brig is super high on the Rangers this year. And then, uh, again, he agreed with me on Arizona. That could be really sneaky. And if I think if they made that move, they would go all the way this year. And I would be cool with that. I'd be fine with it. But baseball family, let us know where you think Otani is going to end up. Where do you think he's going to go? Not so much where you want him to go because we all want Otani to play for our team, right? We all want the best baseball player who's ever lived. Don't at me. He is. It's not even close. Okay, and I'm a Griffey fan. So, all right, enough of Otani for now. But speaking of the trade deadline, the St. Louis Cardinals have said that they're going to be selling at the deadline. Uh, yeah, super duh. They got some issues, got some hills that, holes that need to be filled, some hills that need to be filled, some holes that need to be filled, some things that need to be figured out. I don't know that the trade deadline will necessarily like fix all the issues they have and president john mozoliak mo mozaliak mozaliak i think is how you say it uh he has said the same thing that they've got they're gonna have to kind of collect some guys and get some guys together and they'll be back next year or the year after you know he doesn't think that bringing in pieces now i mean obviously that's what they're selling this year right <laughs> He's not looking at the playoffs this year i think that ali marmal i still think ali marmal is the problem there and that bringing in new pieces for next year aren't going to do anything or it's not going to do anything until they get rid of Marmol because I think he's the problem. Um, but he has also said, here's your picture of Mosaliac. Um, that's how I'm going to say it. Uh, he has also said though, that 
he has no intention of trading Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado. He wants to keep those guys around, which to me says that he thinks that they can turn things around next year or the year after because those guys will still be around. Goldschmidt won't be a free agent until after next year. Um, I can't remember the details on Arenado's contract, but I know they both have no trade clauses. And Arenado wants to be a Cardinal. So they have no intention of trading those guys. So everybody who's saying that their team's going to trade for Paul Goldschmidt or Nolan Arenado to fill a hole uh, down the stretch, it's not going to happen. They're not going to deal them. Um, but they're hot targets, though. I think despite everything they say, I think they would be willing to deal Lars Newt Barr, Brendan Donovan, and Jordan Walker. I think if the price is right, uh, I think those any of those three, any or all of those three could go um, because they could all fetch a pretty good, pretty good, uh, I guess, load of prospects or something, right? So... Uh, keep your eye on the Cardinals. Uh, they could be selling off to some to some contenders here in a couple weeks. Let's talk about the Yankees. The Yankees are in last place in the AL East. But you can stop clutching your pearls, Yankee fans, because they are still over 500. Five games over 500 going into Monday. Only two games back in the wild card. That is a whole lot, sounds a whole lot worse than it really is being last place in the AL East. The AL East is stacked this year. And the AL East is literally better than every other division, thanks to a balanced schedule. So, so let's talk about this a little bit. Yes, they're in last place. It's not nearly as bad as it sounds. But there is also a problem, right? They lost two out of three from the Rockies this weekend. They blew a lead on Sat on Sunday, lost that game in extra innings. They really shouldn't have. Gave up a couple home runs in the 11th. That was ugly. Didn't go well. Uh, but there was some weird stuff going on around the league over the weekend. There were several sweeps. There were five sweeps. Um, some teams lost some series that I was not expecting. I mean, I was shocked that my Mariners came out and lost two out of three from, uh, to the Tigers. That had me feeling a whole lot worse about things after the break when things were feeling pretty good going in. And now they're coming out, they're feeling pretty bad. So... That's just the way that goes, right? That's baseball season. So don't freak out about being last in the AL East when you're still sitting a few games over 500 and you're only a couple games out of the wild card. You still got the Red Sox who, I'm sorry, are not going to sustain any kind of success the rest of the season. They just, they've just they been too up and down. And I know the Yankees have been so up and down. But eventually you're going to get Aaron Judge back and things will improve, right? And this may or may not be good news. I don't know, depending on who you are, how much of a fan you are or not of Josh Donaldson. But he has a grade three calf strain and has no timetable for return. So I'm assuming uh, Yankees fans will not be seeing any more of Josh Donaldson this season. I think he said something a couple weeks ago about how they had him on the Jacoby Ellsbury rehab plan, which means go do rehab elsewhere and we'll see you when we see you. And by that, we mean we'll see you what we'll call it. Don't call us. We'll call you. Uh, I think is the approach that the Yankees are taking with Josh Donaldson right now. Um, so good news, bad news, depends on where you fit on the Josh Donaldson fan or Josh Donaldson bandwagon spectrum. <laughs> so I don't know. Could be any of those things. All right. I mentioned sweeps a minute ago, some weekend sweeps. We had, uh, I have the giants here celebrating because they swept the pirates, the pirates, uh, as much as fun of a ride as that was earlier this year. Pirates are done. Uh, they are not coming back. Um, I still think they have too much talent to be that bad. I don't know what the problem is. Probably pitching, actually. I think it's the problem. <laughs> when Rich over the hill is your best pitcher, I think you've got a little bit of an issue in your starting rotation and your pitching staff in general. And so they're going to have to make some moves, some pitching moves in the offseason to get better. Um, and I think they're going to have to hope that Andrew McCutcheon comes back uh, because I think that his, I do think his leadership in the clubhouse played a significant role in that run that they had early in the year. So, uh, yeah, if they have him next year, I think they'll be okay. They'll have O'Neill Cruz for the full season unless he gets. Guys don't break their ankles in baseball. Come on, it's a it's a bad luck injury, is all that is. The Orioles swept the Marlins. That is a good team sweeping a team that just was not as good as them. The Marlins, I think, are a pretty decent team. They're hanging in there in the AL East. I think they will continue to hang in there in the AL East. Don't uh, don't sleep on them making some moves 
on them buying in the at the trade deadline, I think they'll they'll get some pitching because that's what they need. And I think it'll really help. They can slug with just about anybody, but they need help with pitching. Um, the Orioles are a really, really good team, really great team. Don't be surprised if you see them in the ALCS this year. I'm over here making all kinds of second half predictions. Anyway, uh, the Blue Jays swept the Diamondbacks. I was shocked, absolutely shocked. Um, this is one of those Blue, Jay hot, Blue Jays hot streaks that we've seen this year where they just come in and they are just a wrecking ball for about a week, and then they won't be for another week or two. Um, they've been wildly inconsistent. Um, their highs are really high. Their lows have been pretty low. I, I still can't figure this team out. Um, their highs have had to be really high, though, for them to be able to hang in there in the AL East. So anyway, like I said earlier, the Diamondbacks are on somewhat of a skid the last couple of weeks. I think they'll pull out of it. I think they'll be fine. This team is, I think this team is who we, we saw for the first half of the season. I don't think they're going to fall off. They have a lot of talent. They've been playing really well. Again, they need some pitching, though. Pitching is an issue on that team, and they're going to need to go get some. Um, the Rangers swept the Guardians, or as Briggs says, Cleveland's baseball team. No surprise there, honestly. The Rangers are still really, really good, despite having a couple bad weeks. Um they're gonna go and they're gonna they're gonna beat a team like the Guardians that just can't keep up with them offensively. Right, like it. It sounds dumb to just say they're just going to go score more runs than them, because that's how you win, obviously, right? But that's what they did. They just they just go out there and they just score more than everybody, <laughs> no matter if their pitching is on or off that day. They will go out and just score more runs than the team they're playing. I don't like. I said it sounds dumb and it sounds super elementary and simplistic, but it's what they do. They just go score runs, and they can't be beat because of it uh i do think it'll catch up to them eventually but right now it's working for them and then the twins over the a's they should they should have swept the a's um it came close a couple times i actually picked the uh i actually had the a's winning uh on sunday because i didn't i typically will pick a team that's at risk of getting swept on sunday morning because uh teams will play a real team it seems like teams will play harder if they're at risk of getting swept, right? So, because you, you don't want to get swept, it's embarrassing. So, they and they came really close. I thought they had they were in, they were looking pretty good there for a while, but the Twins uh, ended up taking that one and sweeping that series as well. So, like I said, five sweeps over the weekend, um, some serious wins and losses that I was a little bit shocked by, but. What do you do? That's baseball, Susan. Okay, let's go into our fantasy baseball update for the week. There's Matt Olson. Spoilers, he is your co-high score of the week. High five and everybody. Boom, high five Matt Olson for being the high, uh, high one of the high scorers this week. Let's start at the bottom of the list like we always do. Devastation Incorporated. That is Mike, our listener participant. He went up against Denise, the host of our North Chicago Baseball Together podcast. She is Grace Under Fire. Mike won this one 885 to 866. Now, remember, this was a two-week contest because of the All-Star break. So we had week 14 was, was both the week before and the week of the All-Star break going into this last Sunday. So these scores are going to be a lot higher uh, if you're... If you're keeping track there. Uh, so Mike won that one, like I said, 885 to 866 over Denise. His top score was Matt Olson right here. High five, Matt Olson. Got to get my right hand on the – my left hand up on the screen there to give him a high five on that picture. Uh, Denise's high score was Frederick Freeman with 120 points. He was right there behind him, right there behind Matt Olson. Um, but her next score, she had Ozzie Albies with 100 and Cody Bellinger with 93. Cody Bellinger's having a great comeback here this year. Uh, so good for him. All right. On to the next matchup. We had Big League Chupacabra. That is Jewel. He is my co-host of the Seattle Baseball Together podcast. He went up against John, who's uh, had who was doing the, the the district podcast for us, the district baseball together podcast for us. He is Harrisburg Charlie's. Jewel won that one 823 to 548. His top scorer was Jake Cronenworth, who tied Matt Olson with the high score this week with 124 points. And then uh, John's high score is Vlad Guerrero Jr. with an even 100 points. Next, we have Brigger Mortis. That's Brig up against Jason, one of the hosts of the Philly Baseball Together podcast. His team name is not another fantasy team. Jason won this one 718 to 693. Jason's top scorer is Nathaniel Lowe with 117 points. Briggs was Will Smith, the catcher for the Dodgers, with 92 points. And then the final matchup up here, we've got Burns Turner Overdrive. That is Tori. He's the he's the other the other host, the host of the uh Philly Baseball Together podcast with Jason. He went up against me. I'm Julio Think You Are. 
Tory won this one 690 to 658. His top score with, was Corey Seeger with 93 points, and mine was Dominic Smith with 99 points. Um, I missed a big day with JT Real Muto because I did not pay any attention to fantasy over the last two weeks, given the All Star break and having been on vacation. Vacation's over, All Star break is over. It's time to get back on the fantasy bandwagon. Um, so here's your standings, real quick, or I guess everybody's records. Uh, Tori and I are both five and nine. Jason is nine and five. Brig is five and nine. John is one is one and thirteen. Jewel is your co-leader at eleven and three. Denise is nine and five, and Mike is your other leader at eleven and three as well. All right, baseball family. With that, we're going to take a quick break. But before we do that, we have to remind you about versus game. That's right. We are always asking you what you think about the topics we bring up on the show. So now you have a quick and easy way to share your thoughts with us. We partnered with versus game to bring you games where you can make money for, from participating in polls, trivia, and prediction polls as well. And if you're on the winning side of one of these polls and you get a trivia question right or you get a prediction correct, you can win real money, actual dollar dollar bills to put in your bank account. So you can play for free or you can buy ticket bundles to get a little bit more money, get a little more, more salad for you uh, to play against other listeners and versus game users. And we play as well. Um, and to do that, head to btpod.onversus.com on your mobile browser, because that's the best way to set up uh, and sign up and play our polls, trivia games, and predictions. Again, that is btpod.onversus.com to sign up and play versus game with us today. And with that, baseball family, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we have an interview with Tim Brown, who is the author of The Dow of the Backup Catcher, playing baseball for the love of the game. Welcome back, baseball family. We're really excited to bring you this interview with Tim Mound. He is an author, a uh, New York Times bestselling author. And before we get too much into the reason he's here with us today, we're going to give him a rundown just like we give everybody else. Tim, are you ready? I am ready. My voice okay. is ready. Ish. <laughs> First question. It's come what? And go on us. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. First question is what is your quest? My quest, kindness. Um, can I have a second one? Yeah. Today. Where am I? Here we go. There we go. There it is. <laughs> Today I'm there somewhere. It's about living in the moment. Agreed. Solid. Both solid quests. I like that. Okay, I've got a harder hitting question. What is your favorite color? Blue. Blue. <laughs> Everybody makes fun of me for wearing blue all the time. I love get blue, that. and I don't. I I can't shake <laughs> yeah, it. It's it can't boring, help. but that's what I got. I so, who's your favorite major league baseball? My wife's eyes are blue, so I'm going to go. There you go. How about that? There you go. Who's your favorite major league baseball team? I grew up in New York, a Mets fan. Okay. Um, you know, I covered the game for 30 years, so you sort of stop being a fan. Yeah. And I think along the way, I've sort of adopted like the Rays. You know that whole vibe um down there but but i would i would say mets follow-up question if the mets were a beverage what would they be coors light <laughs> that was fast yeah, was really yeah. Fast. <laughs> <laughs> all right if baseball was an ice cream flavor what would it be baseball was an ice cream flavor um how about mint chocolate chip oh I think we've gotten that one a few times. That we one's have really gotten popular. That. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the last question for you, Tim. What is one unpopular baseball opinion that you have? Um, boy, that's a good one. Um, I hate – well, it's probably not an unpopular – I hate the um, <clears throat> protecting the catcher rule on the throw. Blocking the plate, the whole blocking the plate thing. Maybe it's unpopular in the commissioner's office. So uh, that'll count as an unpopular opinion. But I've always thought I get the one at second base because the guy has to be standing on the base. I don't understand the plate because the guy does not have to be standing on the plate or in front of the plate. It's, it's his choice. So anything that comes into sort of strategic, hate the three batter minimum, hate, hate that sort of stuff. 
Yeah, I get that. That catcher one's tough because so often the throw will put the catcher in front of the plate. It's like, what do you do? You can't let the ball go, right? Right. It it's yeah. become sort of like the balk rule, right? Where they call it and nobody really knows why or why not. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah there was those those two a couple weeks ago where it was just an absolute mystery to everybody as to why it was right. called. Right. It's almost like challenge every play at the plate because it could it's as likely to be overturned in your favor as it is to, to a stand coin up. Flip. A coin flip. Heck, Might as well know. give it a shot. I got, I, you know, I, I got challenges left. I'm going to go. I'm going to run with it. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Exactly. Okay. Thanks for playing our little game with us. We really appreciate that, Tim. So for those of you listening, Tim, Tim Brown is the author of the new book, The Dow of the Backup Catcher, Playing Baseball for the Love of the Game. Um, I haven't had too much of a chance to get too deep into it, but holy cow. I love this oh, book, and I am beautiful. not being hyperbolic. This is outstanding. It's very well written, Tim. What Thank I've you. written, I absolutely, or what I've read, I absolutely love. I I cannot gush enough over it. But my first question mm-hmm. for you about this was, what was it that? Why was the word choice Dow of the backup catcher? Where does um, that you know, because I feel like with backup catchers, their value is in the eye of the beholder that it is a somewhat spiritual uh, awareness of, of who you are when you're in that role, that you have to be grounded, that you have to be in the moment where your feet are. Um, I, don't know, I just felt it was the first thing that fell out of my mouth because uh, when we were sort of kicking around titles for the book, um, in part because of that. And I, and I think the way that guys embrace that job, the ones who do and do it well, it becomes almost uh, a religious sort of experience for them. You know, you have to get your fulfillment from a role that maybe only you appreciate. Uh, and, and you're doing things that hardly anybody notices, which I think to me, you know, it, it's not necessarily a religious thing, but it's a very r- spiritual thing to be that comfortable with what the the values that you believe in and what you're willing to sell out to. Yeah, it didn't take so, long getting into it. Sorry, sorry, Brick, just one thing real quick. Yeah. I was going to say it, it, it didn't take long getting into it to notice the parallels of a lot of people talk about the backup quarterback and his job in the NFL, that it's mm-hmm. like, the backup catcher is like the backup quarterback and about 15 other things in the clubhouse and dugout. Right. Right. He's got such a significant role and yeah, it does take a certain level of acceptance. Like I'm not the main guy. I'm not the quarterback out there. I'm doing all these other things except for that. And it, it was really cool to get some insight into that. Sorry. I go ahead, appreciate it. You know, I would say the only difference is the backup quarterback never plays. I mean, if, if with any luck at all, the backup quarterback never plays mm-hmm. and, uh, the backup catcher is you have to play him occasionally. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's part of the deal. Right. Yeah. So ahead, I spend, I spend a lot of time with Taoism actually. So when I saw this title come through, I thought, Oh man, this is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and pronounce way- it, you pronounce it like you spend a lot of time with it. So I do. Very yeah, I do. Pronunciation of, Dow, <laughs> I like yeah, it. I like it. Thank you. Uh, I have a friend of mine and I. We read the Dao De Ching uh, almost every morning at eight eight in the morning. So um, it, it's it sounds like you know with Taoism everything is about acceptance and it's all about you know finding like you said the value with what actually is there and what actually provides value instead of engineering it and trying to have this idealized version of what what value might be to other people. And that comes through in the introduction so well. I, I would recommend everybody just go, if you, you know, go buy the book, but just read the first, what is it? 13 or eight, or I think it's the first eight pages is the introduction. And I wanted to ask you, was it as emotional writing it as it was for us reading it? Um, yeah. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, so I, geez, I covered, started covering baseball, Major League Baseball in 89. And, you know, I, I was an idiot and, and, you know, sort of 
carried that on with me for a long time, but I, I asked a lot of questions. And when you're, when you're a curious person and you're not sure what you're looking at and not sure why things went the way they went, you, you ask a lot of questions and backup catchers everywhere I went in every clubhouse I ever went into were welcoming and they were patient and they were humble and they had a sense of humor and they picked their heads up from what was right in front of them to see the world. And so the conversations that came from that for decades were always my favorite conversations. They became my favorite people as a result. And I think I was carrying this book with me from the start. And about five years ago, Eric Kratz and I sort of came together on a podcast, as it, as it were, uh, sitting in, uh, in the dugout at Dodger Stadium. He was playing for the Brewers. I was working for Yahoo at the time. And we just hit it off. And it occurred to me as I was walking away was that his story, 19 professional seasons, 14 franchises, 120 transactions. This is a guy who could carry a book about all of the backup catchers, about the culture of backup catchers. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, when I sat down to write it, 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 it did. I did sort of spin back to, uh, you know, the young knucklehead me and, you know, uh, and and sort of my early experiences with the game, because I thought about those guys and I really tried to get a hold of the first guy I ever talked to. I never did. Uh, but uh, there were some some guys back there that that I could reach out to and, and talk to again. And and really, I mean, there was part of me that wanted to thank them for educating me, you know, how to how to sort of see the game and how to conduct myself around the game. So That's was game. Eric Kratz, was he kind of like the super duh guy to be involved with this or was he, or were there other guys who you kind of got involved with along the way and he ended up being the most involved? Uh, no, he was the guy that, that uh, I, I knew that was going to sort of carry the book because of his story, because of his, his background, small town, just outside of Philadelphia, small high school, um, made his high school varsity because the the guy ahead of him got caught smoking on campus and got kicked out off the team. Went to a Division three school, and this is this is for me it's amazing. And I and <laughs> he went four years to Eastern Mennonite University, and no one else in those four years caught a pitch from a pitcher. He caught oh, every God. single pitch across four years um, in college. 866th round draft pick. It just, it just all made sense. Met his wife in college, married her. They had three kids early and this journey, her strength, her character. Um, you know, I'm not sure this book really comes to me without Eric Kratz. And I don't, I'm not sure there's an Eric Kratz if there's no Sarah Kratz. She's so, I mean, she, there is, she is really sort of the ultimate backup catcher the, you know, someone who's never going to be in the box score, but has so much to do with that career. Uh, and, and then ultimately, you know, less important, this project. <laughs> well, maybe that's I, the uh, next book. Yeah, right, <laughs> the wife right. of the backup catcher. And now Sarah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I was going to say, I loved the, the, so obviously it's a human story, right? It's packed with the human element. That's the whole point. But the fact that you loop in so much of the family experience, I think, like you said, grounds the narrative and ties it all together uh, and allows it to be accessible to more than just the diehard baseball fan. Yeah, I love those relationships. And and I've, I've always been drawn to those more human stories. Uh, you know, particularly, I think it maybe started to stand out as the analytics and and all started taking over the game a little bit and suddenly there was a different way to write about baseball and the guys who can do it do it well and do it interesting are amazingly talented i do not have that gift and i, I honestly don't ha really have the interest <laughs> in in that part of the game it's not my job to uh you know con construct a roster uh, for me, it was always go find the good story, go, you know, tell me a story. Uh, uh, and, and then, 
after that, it became, you know, we sort of know the stars, right? And our editors, they always write the stars, write the stars. But those weren't always where the best stories were. And, and I was, again, drawn to this uh, population of players who were closer to the far side of the roster, the far side of, you know, an opening day when they all line up, you know, the guys further to the left, you know, always sort of interested me because they were, to me, it's a much more uh, uh, relatable experience, right? I mean, what do I know about being Shohei Otani or Mike Trout or Aaron Judge? I can't even relate. I have no idea what that must feel like. There's nothing in my life I do that well. And I get the other guys, the guys who are struggling and scrambling, holding on with both hands and, and wondering if they're any good and, and all that stuff. That I get. And so I, I hope those sort of stories and this book sort of speaks to folks more like me. I like that because so often like we talk about growing up like you memorize the back of a baseball card and that's like translated into how baseball works now. You lose <laughs> so much of the story because there's not room on the back of a baseball card to tell the interesting parts of a guy's story. And I think right. I like that, that you're diving into the human side of it and, and going beyond the numbers and seeing the important stuff because that's the, that's the stuff that's awesome. That's the stuff that we really like. Yeah, I, I think as you move along through the book, you'll notice like really the only stat I'm really holding on to is batting average, which I know is an outdated stat. But I do think that the, the sorts of people that I hope will read this book are not going to be into all the stuff, you know, on the next page of fan graphs and the page after that on fan graphs. I feel like it's, it's m the most understandable thing. And there is actually a chapter in there called something along the lines of, you know, batting average doesn't matter says all the people mm -hmm. who don't hit for a living. Um, yeah. You know, you got to like that. And it's on that big scoreboard and it's like 24 feet high, what you're hitting. It feels like it matters, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. We're big fans of average. I think batting average is the most – I mean, I go, I always come back to accessibility because our whole thing is baseball together. And so let's let's make it as simple as possible for everybody. And average is one of those statistics that pretty much anybody can understand. Right. I mean, I get that it doesn't define the player, of course, um, but it, it also – well, you use a good word there. It, it – it, it brings everybody sort of into the conversation. We don't lose anybody throwing around uh, RCA plus and stuff like that. Exactly. Everything like that. So is there one, without giving away any spoilers, is there one story from this book that really stood out to you as like something that was just like above and beyond, or you really want people to hear from, from the book itself? I would say, um, Fewer, I mean, there, there are a ton of them, but I, I think if if you're asking what I want people to take away from this book, um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, without having pounded people over the head with it throughout the course of the book, there are these values among, I think, the best and most level-headed backup catchers that translate into the real world. Um, that like, wouldn't it be great if we focused a little bit more on making the guy next to us a little bit better, if we focus a little less on ourselves, um, and, uh, made him feel good about himself. And, and if you are, um, perhaps someone who's feeling like you're not in the box score necessarily, or you didn't get your uniform dirty today, if you're a stay at home mom or stay at home dad or a nurse or a teacher or someone like that, um, that there is great value along that journey in who you are along that journey. And, it, you know, we don't, and none of these guys got there immediately. Uh, and there's an interesting conversation to be had about whether these guys are born or bred, you, you know, do you take the man and turn him into a backup catcher or do you take a backup catcher skill wise and turn him into that man. Um, and I just, I don't know. I, I, I just feel like I hope in today, everybody's screaming at each other. Everybody hates each other. Everybody's running each other down that there is room for this conversation about uh, so conducting ourselves more like the backup catcher, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, that's nice. 
I like that a lot. That's great. Um, what was the most difficult part of this story? Um, that's a great question. Um, none of it felt particularly difficult. Um, I did feel anxiety about, so like every person you talk to, whether it was, um, one of the, uh, managers who had been a backup catcher, you know, there's 14 of the 30 managers were backup catchers in yeah. right now. Um, or one of the backup catchers themselves or someone who sort of spun off of one of the backup catchers. Uh, every single guy said, Oh, you have to talk to these four guys. Hmm. So by the end of uh, like the, my round of interview, I interviewed like two or three dozen guys. I had another like 80 names of, you know, this guy would be perfect. You need to talk to him. And at some point uh, I had to stop and just start writing the bit, writing the dang book. Cause I would just <laughs> continue. I could have continued on forever. Uh, but it did do my heart good to know that there are so many of these guys out there that, that were well regarded. And, and I know at the end of every interview with these guys, I would ask if they were proud of their career because a lot of them, you know, kicked around a little bit, you know, saw a lot of clubhouses usually carrying a duffel bag from two or three transactions ago or whatever, uh, and hit 198 or 204 or whatever. And, you know, they all had some, something along the lines of, I wasn't always, um, mm. and, but I've come to a place where, uh, I am proud of it. And the thing that they're most proud of, they said was being a good teammate, um, which, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if you would trade that for a $240 million contract. I probably would, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. but it's, you know, if, if this is who you were, um, I, I would hope you're proud of it and, and not, not to lose uh, track of the fact that you you freaking played in the big leagues, dude. You know, I mean, that's exactly that's not nothing. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's one of the things that I think we lose sight of sometimes is that like, especially with backup catchers, sometimes they get kind of poo pooed because it's like, man, he's not as good as a starter. We don't want him in there twice a week, you know, because it's like sometimes as a Mariners fan, it's like, man, sometimes it feels like it's a guaranteed loss, you know, <laughs> but at the same time though, like there are some really great things that come from backup catchers. One of the stats that out that stood out to me early on in the, in this book was how many catchers backup catchers have caught no hitters. Right. And I don't think yeah. that's not an accident. And I think you pointed out to that as well. Right. And I think it's real obvious why it's that yeah. these guys are so committed to that start on that day. They're almost over-prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and there's such trust in the pitcher that, that guy's back there for me today. He's not back there to get three hits. He's not back there to like pad his home run lead or anything like that. He's back there to win a baseball game. Uh, and there, yeah. I think that there goes a long way, especially in that seventh, eighth and ninth inning, right? Where you have a guy who's been sort of walking with you along these four days between starts. Okay, bud, here we go. Are you ready? Yep. That slider looked great when you threw it in the bullpen two days ago. Let's, let's work that early and, all that stuff that leads to something close to, you know, I mean, as close as baseball gets to perfection. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're at our time real quick. The book came out yesterday, right? July 11th. It did. It did. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. It's called the Dow of the backup catcher playing baseball for the love of the game. And you can get that. I'm assuming everywhere. Is that right? Yeah. I, I hope. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no. I checked. You can get it anywhere. <laughs> I, I haven't been everywhere, but I think it's out there. Yeah, it's definitely. But we'll put a link down in the description so that our listeners can go check it out. We highly let's check it out and listen to it. It's a fantastic read. Very excited. Uh, thank you, Tim, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys. This was really fun. Oh, I'm glad. Baseball family, thank you so much for joining us for that fantastic interview. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We had a ton of fun talking to Tim Brown about his book. Again, that is The Dow of the Backup Catcher, playing baseball for the love of the game. You can get that, like we talked about there in the interview, you can get that anywhere books are sold. You can get it on Amazon, um, uh, at Barnes & Noble. That's the place I'm thinking of. <laughs> if you want the audio book, what you can do is you can head down to the link 
uh, in the description of on YouTube, any audio, anything like that, you can head over to uh, Audible and you can get the audio book. We have uh, an affiliate with them, so you can sign up and get a free trial of Audible. Check it out. See if you like it. Listen to the audio book, all that without paying. You get a free month. Again, that's on Audible, and there's a link down in the description. Don't forget to follow that for that. Baseball family, while I'm talking about ways you can support the show, head over to Patreon and search BaseballTogether.com or hit the link down in the description, and you can go over to Patreon and find ways you can support the show. We have five different tiers to support, $1, $5, $10, $15, and a whopping $500 a month. You can pledge to support us. Uh, that is the easiest way to do it, and uh, you can also do it for less than what Brig pays every day for his bougie coffee, and that's just once a month that you would be buying a bougie coffee for Brig and I. Um, and then, baseball family, thank you so much for your support. Don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, and review. Let us know what you think about what we're doing. You can do that in the comments down on YouTube. You can do that in the mailbag as well, or send any questions anywhere. We would love to get them and answer them for you. Um, baseball family, thank you so much for joining us. We will catch you next week. Mm-hmm.